Hi, everyone. I wanted to uh, follow up on our prior sub parts of on uh, Constantine and the Delphic Oracle that he set up uh, within months or less than a year prior to 325 Nicene Conference. So there's no way on God's green earth that this man was a Christian and could be setting up this new center of paganism, its new prophetic center at Constantinople at the same time. And uh him being a Christian. It's just, it's uh, totally bizarre. So this is an important part of things. So this is, uh, I have three episodes on that uh, part nine of the Constantinian series, and there was three parts already. This is going to be a small add-on to make a part four of what's uh, episode nine within the Constantinian series. Anyway, and so this is the title of the last episode. Constantine's new capital was selected by the Delphic Oracle in its founding in 683 BC, and that was because Byzantium, where he was moving, was at one earlier time in 683 BC picked by the Delphic Oracle to be the city for the people who are asking for, you know, what's the best city to move to. So it's not a coincidence that he decides to move the empire there. Of course, it had other benefits or strategic benefits, but it is very strange that he moved from a Roman uh, Latin speaking culture that he'd grown up in and he moves to a country that they, they speak Greek. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, that's what he decides to do. So this was our last episode. And now we're going to take a little deeper dive. So this is I'm going to start from the same slide, but we're going to show you things that we didn't provide last time that I kind of cut out to keep it short. So this is just uh, the leftovers, but usually don't you always like the leftovers better when you've had a meal, like the next day they taste better. So in light of the prior episode, these should help. Anyway, and this column you see in the picture is the serpent column. And it turns out that even though it's a, this is a replica, so they, they put a plaque here. Do you see there's a little stand? So it wouldn't have been just like that, but it would it associated with a temple. You can see there's a temple here. And so it's not just sitting there looking out over over the mountains in the original setup. This is where she would sit on top, very high. So we've shown you these episodes where Plato, she says she would sit very high, be precarious. People, you know, would worry that she's going to fall off. And and there's other mentions many times that she sits on this high seat and it's a seat of three pythons, the, the serpent looking items at the very top. And we'll, we'll get into it later. But anyway, it's called the Serpent Column. It's also called the Three-Headed Serpent. It's also known as the uh, Delphi Tripod. It was built to commemorate the Greeks who fought and defeated the Persian Empire. But even though that was so, it's a memorial, but it, you know, it's not like we would use a memorial. It was a memorial that the Python priestess would use, and that would make it even better for them. Okay. And so here's an article on the Serpent Column of Delphi in Constantinople, its placement purposes and mutilations. <laughs> Uh, November 9, 2013, and he makes a couple of interesting references. The serpent is called the Column of Delphi. It had, uh, with its two companions, the ancient bronze pillars marked the spina of the Byzantine Hippodrome. So what I also mentioned is that it's uh, putting pu being put at and near the Hippodrome was another a factor uh, uh, of, that proves it's related to the worship of Apollo because Apollo is always depicted as driving a chariot of horses like you would see at a hippodrome. So this is not bizarre. Uh, the serpent column is all the more extraordinary simply by its continued existence. I think it's great because now you can see how important it was to uh, Constant Constantine. He, he literally had it moved all the way from Delphi to his new uh, area, and that is what she would deliver her oracles from on top of that and in front of a crowd of people, or in, at that time, because it looks like it was more outdoors than the original version. Uh, it's been on public display for over 2,300 years. It somehow escaped fires, earthquakes, and lootings, which destroyed almost all other Hellenic bronze masterpieces, and it is covered in bronze, apparently. Okay, so it's just interesting. Uh, now, Eusebius reported that there were several tripods from Delphi that were moved to the Hippodrome of Constantinople during the reign of Constantine. So this is mentioned in an article at the uh, byzantinelegacy.com in the article entitled Serpent Column. So that's interesting. It, it drew the attention of Eusebius. So, so when I tell you Eusebius attended the Nicene Conference, he knows 
the Delphic Oracle has been moved there. So this is not a secret from those, these bishops. They're just ignoring it. They're ignoring the fact that this man is following pagan the pagan religion, and they're not telling you. He told you indirectly by telling you that they moved, and you have to put the pieces together. But he's not going to expose uh, Constantine as a fraud, but that's he's kind of leaving it there for us. As the historians of Christianity can help people realize People like Eusebius are either totally corrupt and co-opters, or he's trying to leave behind the breadcrumbs that we can find the truth, which I, I, I hope that's why he was doing it. That's my way of looking at him in a positive way, that he was leaving behind these breadcrumbs. So this is the breadcrumbs he leaves. The, hey, you know, the Delphic tripods have been, have been taken from Delphi and brought all the way to Constantinople. You put two and two together. I'm, I'm, I can't say anything, but you... You know what I'm trying to tell you. I mean, you know what I'm trying to tell you, historians. But apparently nobody gets it because nobody thinks Constantine is anything but a good Christian. Uh, now, this article continues. Emulating Rome, its public works, and its ceremonies also played a significant role in legitimizing Constantinople. See, these public works were designed to legitimize Constantinople. But in what way? Legitimize it as a pagan center. So it legitimized Constantinople and the emperors were residing there. So I have to ask everybody, why did even all the Christian emperors that followed that maybe even you thought had faith, like like Justinian, didn't he have a faith? And Theodosius, he's the one in 381 AD who brought us what? The, the Trinity doctrine. It had not existed before uh, uh, Theodosius. Did, did, what did he do? Did he leave this uh, in the city? Yes, he did. He left that and he left the Apollo bronze statue with the Apollo face being uh, Constantine. That wasn't taken down until God blew the wind, the wind, a storm, a gale storm brought it down in 1106. So this also boosted civil, civic pride of its citizens. So the citizens could take pride in all these pagan objects, the statue, the statue to Apollo and everything else. So here, here we have more at the Byzantine Legacy article. As St. Jerome, that means Jerome who wrote the Vulgate Bible, Constantinople was enriched through the stripping bare of almost every other city founded before Byzantium. So did Jerome, in, now he's about 380 to 405. He does the Vulgate Christian translation of, of the uh, original uh, you know, Torah, Law and Prophets and Torah, and he does the New Testament in 405 AD. They're all released at one time. And he's aware that the ancient world was stripped bare. He must also know that the, that meant the Delphic Oracle. So what Eusebius said 40, 50 years earlier, Jerome is completely aware of even later at 405 AD. So he knows, and this is this is a time period when the, the Trinity doctrine was first developed in 381. So he knows post-Trinity that the church is following a guy who moved everything. Paganism completely had been moved to Constantinople. He knows it by stripping bare almost every other city. The use of spolia had long been associated with Roman imperial might and domination, and this association was particularly emphasized in the circus by moving an Egyptian obelisk to the spina of the Circus Maximus. So there's also an, uh, a pagan obelisk from Egypt that is visible even to this day, I think, in Constantinople. It was moved to the, the uh, Circus Maximus. Augustus emphasized his defeat of Ant the, the uh, obelisk itself. Uh, Augustus emphasized his defeat of Antony and Cleopatra as well as his conquest of Egypt. So I guess actually it maybe reflects some, it was an, an Egyptian obelisk that must have been modified by Augustus to prove he had victory while in Egypt. The sculptural program in the Hippodrome also emphasized its connection to the Circus Maximus, thus the city's Romanitas and the might of its emperors. So again, the Hippodrome, because it had the chariot horses and the horses, which is an Apollo imagery is connected to the Circus Maximus that is connected in turn to Egyptian obelisks and all that kind of paganism. And of course, to the Python priestess, whose this uh, serpent column is at the Hippodrome, where the chariot races are taking place, these Apollo imitating uh, chariot races. The serpent column is also linked with a specific military victory while it lost its... So this is the one thing that it has a memorial aspect to it. While it lost its golden tripod centuries earlier, that means that the seat with the three serpents able to prop her up, 
and that still existed in 1574. So there was a, a drawing. I don't know if it's in this uh, uh, slide uh, slide collection, but there was a drawing from 1574 that showed that it was still there. The three prongs of the serpents that would hold her up in a chair. Uh, there, she would put a flat uh, board there, and she could sit comfortably for the time she was up there. While it lost its golden tripod centuries earlier, the remaining column continued to be associated with the victory over the Persians. It is unclear how much of its original meaning was remembered once it was moved to Constantinople. Well, probably not much if you think about it. You know, do the do the Romans care about these little hieroglyphics or Greek word letters uh, on the side? If they want, they speak Greek in Constantinople, so they're going to be able to see what they said. But it's it's. Constantine is still Roman at heart, so he's not trying to elevate the Greek uh, self-perception, probably. It seems that Constantine claimed to be the heir of the civilization that defeated the Persians when he moved it to the Spina. So if he did, he was trying to promote that he's the heir, the succeeding culture to Greece, and therefore he should be allowed to uh, be viewed as also part of that original victory over Persia. Okay. However, it is also possible that its connection to the sun god Apollo, who defeated the serpent Python, banishing chaos and inaugurating an age of peace and fertility, was not forgotten. Okay, so this this is more likely what's really going on. What what's his whole purpose? His he's not bringing the serpent's column there to remember the Persian de being defeated by the Greeks in in you know 563 AD, uh, BC. Okay, that's probably not what it is. He's bringing the serpent's column to bring together, bring back the Apollo imagery and worship of of um, Apollo and bring back the Delphic Oracle, which he had himself outlawed. We'll see that uh, in a moment. Even after his conversion to Christianity, Constantine continued to use imagery of the sun god. Thus, this linked his own victory over his defeated enemies, Maxentius and Licinius, with Apollo's victory over Python. So, yeah, I'm glad he put that in there because this guy seems to be the only one who's put two and two together is... A, he did not consistently behave like a Christian should have and gotten rid of all these pagan uh, objects. Instead, he, he, he continued to use them and continue. Now, he doesn't say how far he went. Well, he went as far as making a bronze statue and inside there, there a face had to be put inside the face of Apollo that God inside of Constant Constantinople on a, 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 a large high uh, a pillar, just like the serpent pillar. Well, there was a pillar or column to Apollo, and the entire figure in nude is standing there, uh, you know, looking very masculine, very strong. And uh, he's Apollo. He's got a radiating crown. And guess what? The face is Constantine's. And when it fell down in 1106 AD, that's almost 800 years later, it was that face was taken and put in a museum. Okay, um, but uh, and then he's saying this is just another imagery of uh, Apollo's victory over Python to remember the basically the um, the serpent's column. So, but the victory of Apollo over Python, the result of that was is now she instead of being a Pythoness who operates separate and apart from him, she now is his conduit for uh, uh, speaking to humanity. You know, Apollo is up there in some mysterious place, uh, Mount Olympus or wherever he is, and he's communicating long distance or from some place close by. Nobody really ever goes into that. Communicating his prophetic messages through her so she becomes his servant. And so this woman, this Python priestess, is his agent and pro prophetic voice. Okay. Um, let me just st stop right here for a minute. Okay, so this article at Byzantine Legacy continues, and it says, it is more plausible that Constantine saw it as a trophy, meaning the serpent column, after closing the oracle at Delphi due to its role in convincing Diocletian to persecute Christians starting in 303 AD. Okay, so I decided to then research what's going on here. So he's saying that uh, Constantine would want the serpent column there because he shut it down as a result of the role of the oracle convincing Emperor Diocletian in 303 AD uh, to persecute Christians there. Now, Constantine cannot become Emperor of Rome until about 305, so his ability to react and respond to that at that time 
um, is limited, but he he eventually comes to the point where Constantine himself will close the oracle probably when he becomes emperor around 305 AD when Diocletian is no longer emperor. So let's continue to look here. So here, there is an article that discusses some aspects of this, and this is in the, an article entitled An Oracle of Apollo at Daphne and the Great Persecution by Elizabeth de Palma de Jezer. And it was in a, a journal called Classical Philology, volume 99, number one, in 2004, published by University of Chicago Press. So it was a high-end thing. And she's looking at an interesting issue uh, that just tells us a lot more about Constantine and the power of this Python priestess in his life. So, okay, so this article discusses two competing ideas of why uh, Constantine uh, did something to... Uh, the oracle, shutting it down. And was it reflected somehow in an edict he gives in 324, or was it something that arose out of uh, an edict that he gave around 305? So his actions were in 305, so you would think that you, you shouldn't be looking out at 324 to try to figure out what he's doing in 305. So she's going to say, basically, Let's look at the earlier 305 date and what is the oracle issues at that time. It's an oracle uh, of Delphi decree from 299. So I think we can just dismiss anything he's doing, Constantine did in 324, and just focus in on what is the claim that is correct. And Lanctatius gives us the correct, correct Delphic oracle that was at issue. And that's uh, uh, Lanctatius is in his book, De Mortimus Persecutionist. Lanctatius was the Christian tutor of Constantine's son. And he is saying that the reason that Constantine uh, banned the Delphic Oracle, for, Del Delphic Oracle for a time, obviously around 305 AD, when, he, when Constantine becomes emperor, is because earlier, uh, in around 303, the Emperor Diocletian, he was an emperor until 305, you can see that here on the screen, was pressured by his junior colleague Galerius to launch a general persecution against Christians. To resolve the issue, Diocletian sent a heruspect, a soothsayer from his palace in Nicopedia to consult with Apollo at Didyma. And Lanctatius says the oracle answered as an enemy of God. In result, Diocletian issued the edicts that increasingly targeted Christians in the general populations. And... Um, Oh, you know what? Now, now I'm seeing one more thing. So what I think she's actually saying is that's that's an account of something that happened 303 AD, and there's another oracle that was given in 299. Okay, I I read this a little too quickly, but that's good. Just show you, <laughs> got to read everything carefully. So she says, despite the long history of linking these two accounts, the actions of Constantine in 324 and his actions arising out of something that happened in 303 AD by Diocletian acting upon uh, something he obtained at that time from the uh, Python priestess to tell him what to do. And and so she's going to say, wait a minute, there's another third thing to think about. <laughs> it says, so despite the long linking of these two accounts, the 324 and the 303 issue, uh, uh, she's saying that the there are several there are emperors letters meaning Emperor Constantine and several other fourth century texts both Christian and pagan which suggest that Constantine was describing a separate and earlier prophecy from an oracle of Apollo. So when he's blaming, uh, uh, when he's saying why he's revoking the Delphic oracle's powers and let's say it's three o five we're not clear when this happens exactly that uh, that he isn't just predicating it on something that happened in 303 when the Delphic Oracle was consulted by Emperor Diocletian. He's going to reference something else. And this is what she, he, the, the author of this article says. So when she's looking at all his emperor's letters and fourth century texts, they suggest that Constantine was describing a separate and earlier prophecy from an Oracle of Apollo at Daphne near Antioch, so that'd be in Syria, in 299. So we're not talking any longer about what happens in early 303 when Emperor Diocletian sends out a soothsayer to contact the Apollo Didyma, Apollo's, excuse me, Apollo's, uh, Apollo's priestess basically to say what is Apollo's view on things. So it's not that, it's something else that happened in 299. This prophecy in turn triggered a purge of Christian soldiers from the army. 
So this is still in 299, we're still dealing with Diocletian. Remember, he's emperor from 284 to 305, Christian era. That's right there. I'm highlighting it or have my cursor there. So he's an emperor even in 299. So the question is, it clearly can't be 324 that's telling Constantine what he's going to do in 305, right? Or three in that time period. And Lanctatius is saying it's this event in 303 AD when Diocletian cons directly sends out a consultant to get the Python priestess's viewpoints on behalf of Apollo. No, it's some earlier uh, prophecy of the oracle, meaning the, Del the Python priestess at uh, Daphne. So apparently she was also at Daphne at that time near Antioch in Syria. So it appears there were multiple centers people could go to to get the uh, the Python priestess to talk to them. So Daphne apparently was another place that had, uh, maybe this is like a McDonald's franchise that was opening up because it was a big money maker. Remember, that's the key. A lot of money to may be made being a Python priestess. Anyway, so um, she's an oracle at da Daphne, and this happened in 299. This prophecy in turn triggered a purge of Christian soldiers from the army. So Diocletian obviously is still emperor in 299, and he acted on the python priestess in this episode so not just not just in the 303 cons consultation with the python priestess but in the 299 consultation with the python priestess diocletian keeps going back over and over again to the python priestess uh, who's the prophetess for apollo to get guidance on how to run his army so i i just think this underscores what i've said before when when the python priestess endorses paul this is the same woman who Emperor Con <laughs> Diocletian is listening to to make decisions in the military and how to run thing, run his empire. He's consulting this woman. He he won't make a move without making sure she's on board with what he wants to do. Do you do we not uh, comprehend? I hope uh, just but there's, there's a little snippet. You're getting a clue of how important she was, and but also at the same time. It tells us now this is all the view you get for free of this article. So I can't find out exactly everything she's thinking. Uh, let me just look at this footnote and I'll be right back. Okay, uh, we're primarily done here. I'm just going to tell you a couple of little curious things I see in this footnote. But uh, basically what we've established is Constantine took an action against the Python priestess is some something maybe to do with a 299 oracle that uh, Diocletian obeyed. It could have also been the 303 uh, oracle from the Python priestess that uh, Diocletian obeyed. One of the two, or both, frankly. Why can't they be both? But she's saying when you have to pick which is the one that's more influential for why he revoked her authority, uh, it would. she thinks it's this 299 date, the, what happened in 299. So that's Maybe, maybe, who knows? It's not important for me and you, but what is important is what's the big picture. Big picture is this lady, this Python priestess has a lot of power, a lot of power, and but she's shut down by Constantine at the same time. So then you have to wonder why is he resurrecting her or has, he or, has she already come back sometime after he shut her down? So let's say he shuts, Constantine shut her down in 305. Did he let her come back under his empire at some point in time? And that's why she's, he, when, he tra when he transports all her tripods from Greece, from Delphi, and takes them all the way to Constantinople in 324, what's, why is he doing that? He's, set, he's obviously setting her up again. Maybe she was already back in business or he <clears throat> or he wants Constantinople to be known as the new center of the of the Delphic Oracle. And he takes her as a serious prophet of God. <laughs> OK, in his well realm of thinking. OK, <clears throat> so let's just take a look at this footnote because there's just a couple of interesting things. You learn a little bit when you read stuff like this. And this is all I can read. I mean, for free, uh, although H.M. A.H.M. Jones dates the army purged to 297 and 299 is now generally accepted. So what I think she's focusing in on, wouldn't Constantine be more concerned about the actual purge of the army? This happens in 299, and this is the year of the uh, Delphic Oracle telling Diocletian to do uh, a persecution. So this is why I think she's saying, hey, this 299 purge uh, coincides with the Delphic Oracle, and therefore that's really what more likely explains 
why uh, why Diocletian acted, and that's the Delphic Oracle uh, pronouncement that angered Constantine, not the one from 303, which led to a different purge. So that's interesting. So he was angry four years beforehand from this purge is what she's trying to say. And that's possible. And she says this is discussed in uh, Barnes' book, Constantine and Eusebius, 1981, 18 and 19. So those who are curious about this might want to look into it. There's also an article, P. Davies, The Origin and Purpose of the Persecution of AD 303. So you can see there's one in 299. There's one in 303 AD under Diocletian. And and Constantine is the gets the brunt of this as a commander, and he's losing troops due to the persecution by Diocletian, and it's pissing him off. He wants to win a battle. He doesn't care. I'll take Christians. Christians can die just as easily as the pagans. You know, that is, if you're thinking of it in military terms, so Constantine is not understanding what's the purpose of this uh, persecution within the ranks, and he's he's getting uh, upset. And Burgess writes an article called The Date of the Persecution of Christians in the Army. So this is apparently a big focus of scholarship. Interesting that people spend a lot of time on this. I would just simply say, if I'm if Constantine's angry, it's going to be either 299 or 303 uh, actions of Diocletian based on this pagan uh, priestess. And I, that's going to make me want to do something to shut her up or get control of her if I'm an, uh, when I become emperor, if I'm Constantine. So that's what he's probably thinking. Um. Okay, so what else is going on here? And then uh, in Lanctatius' case, so remember Lanctatius, if I'm not incorrect, he is the tutor, Christian tutor to Constantine's son. Uh, and then he's known for writing these books about what's going on intimately in the life of Constantine. Why not? He lives in the house, so he could he could speak speak somewhat more than others. Lanctatius says that Diocletian's failure to read the auspices at the palace, meaning the uh, oracles of Delphi. Uh, in his book, he, De Mortis, I don't know the title of the whole book, but it's De Mort Purse 10.1 dash 4, led to his decision to purge Christians from the army and punish those in court. Okay, so it's uh, Lanctatius, is, Lanctatius is blaming more the 303 date for that because that's when he didn't apparently read. So he sent out the the soothsayer to get the message from the Python priestess, but he doesn't read the oracles in detail, which apparently, according to Lanctatius, had he read them, he wouldn't have punished the Christians as much, apparently. Uh, and so uh, in this same article, Lanctatius says, subsequently, 10.6, he says, he says that in doing so, that uh, basically failing to read the auspices, they were not as harsh as they, they, the action that Diocletian is going to take, Diocletian, as a result of not reading them thoroughly, he began to per persecute uh, Christians. And in the Latin, it's interesting, it's Galerius, that's a co-emperor, co co-authority uh, within the empire, uh, had uh, persecuted Persequendos Christianos. So there's a name Christian in literature there, right? That's pretty unusual. Instigaret, you could figure that out. It's instigated Diocletian, qui eam principium ficarat, ficarat which uh, uh, began, uh, which made the beginning of the persecutions by instigated what became the, the, the beginning of this work by Diocletian of attacking Christians. So he's blaming the 303 episode while the author of this article is blaming the 299 episode with the python priestess um and then he uses she's just now mentioning like she just uses the words that that uh, diocletian uh drove the emperors uh the no no that the python priestess had uh hold on lanctatius says that these aborted auspices meaning the auspices is a code word for the, the oracles of the a Python priestess. So she's trying to give a message. And apparently it didn't get through correctly to Diocletian. And the, the aborted auspices, meaning they're, they're ignored, drove the emperors to storm the temple of God, expungnarent de templum, an expression he uses throughout his works to refer to the persecution. Okay, so again, is... What she's even saying is, if you look carefully at what Lanctatius is saying, who's blaming the 303 case, 
is he even undercuts his own argument because the Python priestess there is not as negative as it, uh, Diocletian assumed. He kind of just heard some bad news, what it said, and he ran with it and then started persecuting the Christians and storming the walls of the temple of God. When had he looked, to, taken the time to read her oracle, it wasn't as bad as he thought it was. That's what Lanctatius is saying. So actually, Lanctatius is sort of apologizing for whatever the Python priestess said. It wasn't as bad as uh, Diocletian thought it was, and he started to persecute Christians unnecessarily in the 303, as a result of the 303 oracle. So I think that the reason the author of this uh, article in the magazine here, she is mentioning that to prove her point, which she thinks it's Constantine's retaliation is not on the 303 oracle, which Lanctatius himself says wasn't so bad. It was the 299 oracle from Python Priestess. That's the one that was much more dangerous. And that is the one that, uh, uh, wait, no, actually, actually, we don't know the full contents of the 299, um, oracle, except that it triggered a purge of Christian soldiers from the army. So I assume this article will explain more in detail what that says and why she believes that's obviously what Constantine was more upset about, not the 303 oracle, which, as I said, Lanctatius was defending that it wasn't as bad as Diocletian assumed it was when he, when he acted on news about it and he started persecuting Christians apparently unnecessarily. Okay, anyway, this is just all, again, little details. The little details are what tell you what's really going on. Why are emperors paying attention to this python priestess? Why are they doing things? Why are they overreacting and, and making actions and decisions based on what she supposedly says? It's just craziness, but she is that influential. And so just think about it. This is only, Nicaea is at 324. So from three, 299 to 324 is 24. Five years, right? So he's bringing the Python priestess 25 years later back into Constantinople. He's somehow reviving her. Now, this time he can control her. Is that maybe why he's doing it? Who, who knows? And at the same time, he's pretending to be against, you know, uh, polytheism that, you know, can have multiple gods. But you have to kind of understand that in a pagan world, if you believe in Apollo, you believe he's the supreme God. And if you can equate him with Jesus, just saying, and you think Jesus is God and you think Apollo is God, you can, and you synthesize them together in your mind, you say, this is, this is the number one God. You can believe that polytheism is bad because I've now centered on one God among the many gods, because Constantine would have to personally believe Apollo is Apollo, meaning the son of Zeus, and his brother is Dionysius. You know, he has to believe the whole mythology, but he's, said, he's saying to himself, I'm going to focus in on this one God, the God of the sun, and I'm him. So he doesn't want to have a polytheistic universe anymore. He wants to have a universe centered on himself as Apollo. And he wants people to think of Jesus in identical terms to Apollo so that you will accept in the end, you know, that that believing in Jesus will just be one step closer to accepting him, Augustine, as God. And if you read the works of Eusebius, you would almost believe that Eusebius had been sold, unless Eusebius is pulling our leg, that he had been sold, that Constantine is an oracle of God, that he speaks as a divine prophet. That's what, when he does the oration of Constantine, you would, you would, you would be absolutely sure that he thinks Constantine is like a messenger of God. And, and Constantine thought the same thing, and he had himself buried with the 12 apostles. He had all the apostles exhumed or their bo bodies supposedly exhumed and put in coffins next to himself and buried with himself at Constantinople. So he would be the 13th apostle. By the way, he didn't include Paul, but I don't know if that means anything. So anyway, I uh, hope this helps everybody understand the depth of, of uh, the mindset of Constantine is not what you think it was. All right, and I just want to uh, uh, get you guys interested in looking for my next video because I found out something very fascinating. The whole idea of the key row issue with Constantine and that was a symbol of Christ and he saw it in the sky. Well, he knows that's a lie. Well, let me put it this way. He knows that's not a symbol of Christ. The key row, you see this coin here? 
do you see I'm, I'm highlighting here? Can you see I'm circling this? This is a key row. This is a key row exactly as on uh, the emblems or shields that he claims he used later when he had a victory over Maxentius and so on. Well, this is a coin of Ptolemy III. Ladies and gentlemen, this is 300 in the 300s BC. There it is, the key row. Let's go back here a little bit. This is a, an article called the Constantine the Great, the Coins Speak, page 16. And we're going to go through this later, but I just want to give you an idea. The key row appeared for the first time in the 3rd century BC on the Greek bronze of Ptolemy and certainly could not have referred to Christ. So when you see there's a key row, not here. There's not a key row here, but hold on here. I want to show you something. So this is a coin with a key row supposedly in a helmet. Now, we don't know precisely what year this one was, but we have another one, and we're going to show you that. Um, okay, so here's one. Yes, here's a key bronze coin. That seems to be Constantine with a key roast atop a standard piercing a serpent. Okay, so this is a, an Egyptian pagan symbol, not a Christian symbol. Okay, it's not what you think it is. And then this one is supposedly another one, a civil medallion with a key row. Where's the key row? I think it's up here, actually. In his... So you might think this is a cross. This is just a sword and it's a handle. No, I think it's right here. Here's the key row and the top of the head. And I think that is Constantine. I'm not sure. Um, but you see, so the... Uh, um, And, and that's a that's considered a Christian symbol, and so that uh, there's only of all the coins ever uh, stamped by Constantine, uh, the, the Constantine the Great, only one percent uh, might be classified as having a Christian symbol. If you accept this fraud <laughs> that the key row is Christian when it really isn't Christian, okay? All right, God bless. Uh, look out for that episode. I hopefully we'll get that out today.